Well, hello, friends. Welcome back to Hack the Planet. Uh, today, we're looking at another uh, exploit for Serenity OS, this time by someone who goes by Braindead on GitHub. Uh, and it was part of the same Capture the Flag competition as the uh, last uh, exploit that we looked at. But this one uses a slightly different uh, bugs to um, gain root access. So um, you can check it out, by the way, on github.com slash braindead. Uh, so it's the same challenge as last time. So there is a uh, flag in the um, second IDE hard drive uh, that you have to get out. And I wasn't actually able to um, replicate the second part of this exploit because I think I just don't have the same uh, build system setup that, that um, the brain dead does. Um, but um, that's just the part where, where he gets the flag out from the um, hard drive. But he already has root access at that point. So the interesting stuff is how he gets root access, basically. So that's what we're going to look at now. So he has indeed found a zero-day kernel. Uh, I suppose this is local privilege escalation. Um, and the first bug is that the syscall write v does not validate IOV base pointers. And this can be used to read arbitrary kernel memory. And I'll show you that bug right away. So um, let's go to the write v syscall. So this is the state of the tree at the time of the competition, by the way. So you make a write v syscall. So write v, if you're not familiar, uh, it's like write, except that you pass in a um, set of buffers that you want to write. So it allows you to write multiple buffers with one single syscall, um, which can be very handy sometimes, because sometimes you have these separate buffers, but you don't want to concatenate them yourself in user space to create one big buffer to send. But you can still tell the kernel, hey, send from all of these separate buffers. Um, so uh, we do validate the... Um, the array here of i of x. So let me just show you actually. An i of x is just a um, base address and a length. So it's as if you're calling write with a bunch of these, uh, uh, which e with each one of these. Except, so we validate the array here, and if the array is not invalid memory, then we return eFault. But um, we never validate the individual um, entries in the array. So we just get here to the loop. Um, and we want to iterate IOV count times, and then we just um, write the base pointers without thinking too much about it. Uh, and this is where the bug is right here. So um, if uh, if you put a kernel space address in IOV base, the kernel doesn't care. He's just going to read it for you anyway. Uh, so he will read. A kernel space address here and then write it to a file descriptor and of course that's trivial to exploit in, a, in various ways and the easiest way is to just uh, make a pipe which is exactly what he will do um, right so he makes a pipe and um, write these into one end of the pipe and then reads from the other end of the pipe and that allows him to read the kernel memory and then um, the second bug is a time of uh, time of check time of use um, bug in the clock nano sleep syscall, uh, which allows him to write four zero bytes to arbitrary kernel memory. And uh, that's a very powerful uh, bug because uh, there are a lot of reasons that you would want to write zeros to something. Uh, for example, the process user ID. And uh, that's what he's going to do with that. So um, first thing he does, he uses the above primitive, so he uses this um, write v bug to locate the process structure. And it's indeed true that we don't have any kernel address space uh, layout randomization. And then he goes there to zero out the effective user ID field. Uh, now, if you look at clock nano sleep, so he talks about it this way. Let me show you what it looks like. Um, Let me show you this sucker. So, um, or actually his way of showing it, <laughs> because there's so much code here, so it's, it's actually a bit easier. But basically, uh, we have these incoming parameters, right, to each this call. And the reason that we have a struct of parameters, by the way, um, is 
see we have four parameters here. And the problem is that because we are on 32-bit x86 right now, um, we can only take up to three uh, arguments as um, registers. And then the rest of them have to go in a struct. That's because of the syscall calling convention. So the syscalls, they use, we use registers for arguments. So it's like, uh, I forget right now, but <clears throat> uh, it's right here somewhere. So there's like um, ax is the function number, and then dx is the first argument, cx the second argument, and bx is the third argument. <clears throat> uh, but there's no fourth argument. So um, for that, we pass a struct instead. And that ends up causing some problems. So if you look at, <clears throat> excuse me, if you look at Braindead's uh, little um, miniature version here, if this is called, we can see that we validate um, that these are valid addresses. Uh, and then we sleep for a while, <clears throat> and then we store the amount of time that was left to sleep in the remaining sleep parameter. Uh, and this is indeed a problem because we validated here, and then we went to sleep, and then we write to it after we wake up. And in the time where we were sleeping, <clears throat> somebody could go and um, make params, params point somewhere else. <clears throat> Jesus, excuse me. Okay, hopefully I have my voice now. Um, and uh, that's exactly the bug that he talks about here. So the bug is that the param struct is stored in user space. So this is called just receives a uh, pointer to user space, this params thing. And of course, we start by validating it, just checking, is this a valid pointer that we can read for this process? Otherwise, eFault, sure. And then we uh, validate that the um, requested sleep part of the parameter struct is a valid pointer and that the remaining sleep is a valid pointer. And the bug is actually really sneaky here because you don't see it doing this, params, like that, right? Because we use this freaking, um, what's it called? Uh, structured binding declaration here, where we bind these names to um, the param struct. And it's this diabolical, stupid little thing that <laughs> makes it really hard to spot. But um, this here is not a copy of the requested sleep value in params. It's a something different. It's like a it basically this will generate the code to do this again. So uh, effectively what we're doing is this. And um, that would be remaining. And I totally did not uh, realize this about structured bindings. Um, that they would that they would behave this way, uh, and then when we set the remaining sleep here at the end, after we've slept. So where's the sleep? Wait, where's the sleep? Why am I blind here? Either we sleep this way or we sleep that way, depending on if it's an absolute or a relative uh, time that we're sleeping, and then. Uh, if we have time left, or no, if we don't have time left, then we say remaining sleep. Hmm. There are probably other issues here, but but anyway, now the problem is here where we're assigning to remaining sleep. So this basically should be read this way, and now you see the problem, right? We are dereferencing the params uh, pointer once again. Um, which means that if, while we were sleeping, somebody were to screw with this, uh, this struct and make it point somewhere else, uh, make the remaining sleep pointer point somewhere else, then we would not be writing the amount of time left into some arbitrary memory. And that's exactly what his exploit does. Uh, so he puts the process to sleep and uh, then goes and um, changes the that pointer while that process is asleep. And I don't actually know exactly how he does it. We can look at his exploit and we can see 
Um, so let's take a look at it. He has this exploit is really really big because he's like replicating um, all the Serenity uses call stuff in a standalone file. So he doesn't build this as part of the Serenity build system as the um, the previous exploit that we looked at. It just uh, sort of slotted itself into the Serenity user land, which probably made it a lot easier to work with. Uh, but this guy has has set it up so that it's standalone, and he has all of his own data formatters and stuff. Um, so it's it's nice that that to see that someone was able to take the time and set this up uh, instead of what I would consider making it very uh, way easier for himself. <laughs> um, so let's see, he does a fork and. This is the process struct. I'm guessing that, yeah, he's like already, he already knows what the process struct looks like, right? Because the competition was targeting a very specific revision of Serenity. So we already know where all of these members are in the process struct in the kernel. So I guess then all he has to do is go looking for it. How does he do that? Leak mem e. Let's see what it says. To exploit, you create a thread that will change remaining sleep to address of our user ID after one second. Right. And then create a process that will wake us up after two seconds. And then enter clock nano sleep for 2.5 seconds. Right. So, what does he do with that? This is where he makes the pipe for the exploitation and then leak mem, I guess that's the primitive, right? Um, destination and then some kernel address and the amount to read, I guess. Uh, yes, so you can see here he's calling write v with this iovac that has just some kernel address in it and the kernel doesn't care, doesn't fault, doesn't e-fault, I mean. Um, so, per, oh shit, so he already knows where the global process table is. That's how, I guess that's in a, uh, it's in a hard-coded location, of course. So if you have the kernel image and everything is exactly where it's supposed to be, then there's no challenge in finding all the processes. So he can just iterate through the process table. I guess that's what he's doing here, just looking for the first uh, entries in the process table. Okay. Hmm. You have to, to do something about stuff. Like um, it's it's too easy. The the fact that you can like if you have the same exact build locally, the fact that everything is in the same place in someone else's running copy of the system, that's very sad. And some kind of um, some kind of a memory layout randomization would definitely be useful um, to mitigate some of some of these things. Uh, but that's not something that I've started on yet. But we'll get to mitigations. Uh, so he iterates through the global process table and let's see here. So it creates a process struct, uh, reads the memory into it, and then uh, dumps it out on screen, and then dumps out these things about the process, and it says, oh, I found myself, if we run into the PID that we're looking for. So I guess we can run the exploit, actually, to see what it looks like. So, pwn. All right, so, I guess here he finds himself, right? So this is the right V thing where he um, reads four bytes somewhere from kernel memory, from this address in kernel memory. What's that one? That's the G processes thing. Right, so he reads these four bytes here, finds the global process table, and then he wants to read this one. I'm guessing that's the... Um, first entry in the process table. Hmm. 
Hmm. This is really making me question um, the memory layout of, of the kernel stuff. <laughs> the fact that you can find everything so easily is, is a bit uh, not great. Um, but we'll, we'll lie. That's something I have to go and research. But Okay, so we find ourselves in the process table and then about to create thread. Okay, so what does he do with that? Um, other pid started. Okay, so he forks. But the important part is that he figures out where the user ID, effective user ID of the uh, current executable process is stored in the kernel memory. Adder of EUID. And then um, he just does a fork and goes to sleep. And then um, kills the parent with a comp signal, okay. So it just goes to sleep and then wakes up the parent again. And I guess this is so that the parent can break out of nano sleep. Now what do we do here? We set up the nano sleep, this is called, and create a thread. Hmm. Why is it necessary to create a thread? I don't even know. Oh, it's a thread that changes the remaining sleep. Of course, changes the pointer. So, other thread. Where are you? Right here. So he spawns a secondary thread that changes the, um, the pointer. That makes sense. Okay. Very crafty. Um, okay. So the thread is started, and then the thread goes to sleep for however long that was, one second. And of course, before that thread wakes up again, we end our, put ourselves into nano sleep, and then the thread wakes up, uh, overwrites the remaining time pointer in the nano sleep arguments so that it points to the effective user ID of the current process, and then when we return from nanosleep, our effective user ID is zero. Look at that. That's clever. And then you can just spawn a shell. And he's root. That's really, that's really beautiful. Like, I, I really love this stuff. It's, um, it's so much fun to, to see these things, and, and it's like, uh, I don't know, there's just something beautiful about it, that uh, someone can sit down and just uh, pick at something until it come, until he finds a way into it. Uh, I, I really dig that. So huge props to, um, to Braindead for finding a way in, and uh, it's very good. I, I mean, I, I realized that the system was, was not really putting up a fight um, back back then, <laughs> back then, which was what a week ago. Um, and let's talk about some mitigations, because then, of course, like he didn't get the flag yet. But this was the part that I can't replicate locally because of the um, the difference in our in our build setups. But but he gets root this way, right? So that's the important part. Um, let's just see that we got root as well. But uh, I'm pretty sure that you could see it, right? Id root. And then, of course, root has a million ways to uh, do whatever he wants. Um, but the interesting thing now is to talk about the mitigations. So. Um, the fix here was definitely to stop doing this and instead, I guess I'll update to the current version of the code. Nano sleep. <laughs> so now we actually validate the params and then we uh, copy out the params. Uh, from the param struct into local variables, and then we use those going forward. 
Um, and we don't use the, we don't dereference de the params pointer anymore after this point. So um, after we validated the pointers, we never refetch them from the params pointer, basically. So, and this was a unpleasantly frequent pattern in the kernel. So I've, I've gone through and I hope I've fixed um, all of these issues. Um, there might be some lingering, but hopefully they will reveal themselves. Um, and I'll tell you why in a moment, but let's also look at write v. So in the case of write v, we were previously we were not at all um, validating the IOVEC base pointers. So now what we do is we create a vector here where we make a copy of the IOVEC pointers. And um, as we're making that copy, then we validate them as we go. And then we never uh, look at the IOVEC array again, but instead we just refer to our local copy that we've made of the um, array. And yeah, yeah, like I mentioned, we validate as we go. Um, and this is a, this is kind of an annoying issue, right? Because validation, validation, validation. It's very important to validate all the pointers. Um, but I, I also uh, learned about, uh, I've been learning so much about security mechanisms over the last few days and just trying to read everything that I can find about this and read how people attack systems and so on. And uh, I found a whole bunch of things that, that were, we didn't have enabled, that we should have had enabled, that we now do have enabled. And I've turned a whole bunch of things on um, in terms of CPU protection. So we're now running with um, supervisor mode execution prevention, um, user mode instruction prevention, I think it's called. Uh, we have um, supervisor mode access protection as, uh, as of today. Um, actually, just before I started recording this video. So that's something I wanted to talk about in NanoSleep here, for example. We can now see that I'm doing a stack and a clack. And this is because we now have a supervised remote access protection enabled in the kernel. And what that means is that uh, the CPU will not allow uh, the kernel to read from user space memory or write to user space memory um, unless you um, tell it that it's okay temporarily by enabling a flag here and then disabling the flag when you don't want to allow it anymore. So um, this is something that has to, we have to basically apply this pattern throughout the code base or throughout the kernel. Um, wherever we are accessing user space memory, we need to um, like enable and disable this temporary um, protection thingy. We have to disable it temporarily and then enable it again when we're done. And this here is a kind of a bad example of, of how to do this. I, I'm just getting it a little bit lazy while <laughs> implementing it because there's so much of this. And the real pattern that I'll be applying everywhere is um, something more like this, copy to user. So let's see if we can find some pleasantly readable example of this. I guess all of them are just as good. Um, so in the pipe syscall, for example, uh, so instead of assigning to the um, output pipes, which we get here in the argument, what we do instead now is we use copy to user, um, copying to the address that we want to write to, the address of the thing we want to write there, and the size of the thing that we're writing. And it's essentially mem copy, but with one important difference that it temporarily disables SMAP, so Supervised Remote Access Prevention, um, for the duration of the uh, mem copy. And same thing with memset. Memset user also just disables SMAP while it operates. And the SMAP disabler is just stack and clack, basically. Um, so this is something that I'm hoping will will at least make it a little bit harder to, um, to, you know, um, exploit at least, at least some bugs. And supervisor mode execution prevention is, by the way, uh, it's, it's another form of the same thing. So where can we see that? 
Um, I guess we can just look at where we enable it. Um, so if this feature is available in the computer, in the CPU, we'll just enable it. And what it does is that uh, the kernel is no longer allowed to jump to user space addresses to run code there. So if you try to if you try to somehow subvert the kernel into executing user space code, it's not going to work. It's just going to give you a um, execution or instruction fetch page fault, which is similar to how um, an NX failure looks like or an NX fault. And this actually kind of stops um, the actually stops the two exploits that we've seen so far. Um, but you could work around it, but it, it just, um, they, both of them kind of relied on being able to uh, get the kernel to jump to a user space um, payload. And that's no longer possible with SMEP. So that's turned on now. It's pretty cool. So we have SMAP and SMAP, and um, I'm pretty happy with those. And I guess I can show you on syscall entry we always make sure we turn on these map protection when we enter, uh, just to be good boys, you know. Um, but in terms of other mitigations, it's like I'm just running all over the place trying to cover as many things as possible. And hopefully, um, I will learn more and more about this as I go. Um, certainly, if anyone is interested in this type of stuff um, and you're interested in, in like helping out or uh, hacking the system and showing off that you could or anything like that, whatever angle works for you, I'm, I'm very, very interested in anyone um, interested in helping out, I guess. Does that make sense? Um, because I have a lot of catching up to do here. And it's absolutely amazing to, to read these things, and, and I love it, and it makes me realize just how little I know about this stuff. Because, um, you know, I've, I've, I've done the script kitty thing when I was, like, a teenager <laughs> a long time ago, and a lot of it is reminiscent of that, but of course I didn't really understand what I was doing back then. Now I have a bit more of a clue, and... Um, I, I don't want to be ignorant about these things, so a lot of work to do. Um, but yeah, thank you, I guess, thank you very much to Braindead for this very interesting exploit and finding these very bad bugs so that I can fix them and, and learn about them. And thank you to the HXP uh, CTF and to um, YYYYYYYY. <laughs> who uh, contacted me about the exploits. And um, thank you to you, the viewer, for taking an interest in this little investigation video. And I guess, uh, I guess it's gonna, gonna be an interesting time ahead, learning more about these things and trying to figure out more, more mitigations. Um, more things that we can do. So, yeah. I guess that's going to be it for today's video. So, <laughs> thanks for watching. And uh, if we get any more exploits or interesting write-ups like this, and um, do check this one out, by the way. I'll put a link in the description. Uh, if we get more exploits, I will definitely uh, go through them and um, and show them to you because they are fascinating. And of course, we'll also fix them or mitigate them somehow. Yeah, that's it. So have a great day and I will see you next time. Bye.